السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله We are journeying through Zad al-Mustaqna, the chapter of prayer, the book of prayer I should say, and we've come to the chapter of Juma, and we've reached the part with the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, Al-Hajawi, he said, Wal Jum'atu Raka'atan, that Juma is two Raka'at, and this is something which they ijma' upon of the ulama, there's a consensus of the ulama, that Juma is two Raka'at, and we have also in the Hadith, which is collected by Imam Ahmed, and authenticated by Sheikh Al-Albani, in Al-Irwa Al-Ghalil He said for example on the hadith of Umar radiyallahu anhu wa salatu al-jum'ati rak'atan Umar radiyallahu anhu said that the salatu al-jum'a is two rak'at tamamun laysa bi qasrin it's complete and it hasn't been shortened ala lisan al-nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon the tongue of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so this is something which is well established that salatu al-jum'a is to be formed as two rak'at the author, he says, يُسَنُّ أَنْ يَقْرَعَ جَهْرًا It's recommended and it's sunnah that the salah should be recited aloud. And Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah Ta'ala, the humble scholar in Zad al-Ma'ad, in his famous encyclopedia of Sira and Fiqh and Hadith, etc. Zad al-Ma'ad, he said, وَقَدْ ذَكْرَ وَقُلْ أَنَّ هَدِي النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي الْمُجَامِ الْكِبَارِ that the Prophet ﷺ, his guidance in the large gatherings would be that the Prophet ﷺ, when he would recite like on Eid and it is this at the large gatherings he would recite loudly even though this is from Salat al-Nahar even though it's from the prayers of the daytime which are normally recited quietly so it's recommended that the recitation in this prayer is done loudly the author he says في الأولى بالجمعة وفي الثانية بالمنافقين It's recommended according to the author that in the first raka'a Surah Al-Jum'a is recited and in the second raka'a Surah Al-Munafiqeen is recited. The author he says وَتَحْرَمُوا إِقَامَتُهَا فِي أَكْثَرَ مِنْ مَوْدِئٍ مِنَ الْبَلَدِ إِلَّا لِحَاجَةٍ The author he said it's haram, it's forbidden that there is more than one Jum'a in a land. In a land here he means in a locality okay without need so if there's no need for more than one Juma, then this is something which is forbidden and it shouldn't take place so one of the objectives of the Juma, as is well understood is to gather the people together and with this gathering there comes about brotherhood and unity and people enjoy being together worshiping allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if there's more than one Juma without need then this negates this noble objective of having people come together to worship Allah as a as a community. So without more than without a need, there's no Juma, there's no second Juma in the land, in the locality. And it's interesting to know that the only time there was more than one Juma in a particular locality, you could say even in Medina, for example, was more than 270 years after the death of the Prophet. So the companions and the early Salaf, they never had Ta'addadul Juma. They never had more than one Juma in a locality, okay? And this only took place after around 270 years after the, after the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 270 years or so after the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the author, he says that this is not allowed, Ta'addadul Juma, more than one Juma is not allowed unless there is a need. Shaykh Muqtalq Jasr Hafizullah Ta'ala, he mentions that need is to be stood as follows. For example, if you find that in a particular locality, the Juma is very far for a people, that a people live on the east of a particular city and for them to get to the west, it's extremely difficult for them. In this situation, it would be allowed for them to have another Juma in their locality. And also, of course, if the one masjid uh, the Masjid al-Kabir, the large masjid where people gather for Juma, is not spacious enough, uh, then they would be allowed to have a second Juma. And also, if you're in a situation with the tribes of the locality, uh, they have an issue with each other and it's very tense, uh, there's not peace amongst them, and if they were to be together, this would call trouble and tribulation, then in this situation also, there is allowed to have a second Juma. So Sheikh Mutalaq Jasr Hafidullah, he said these are from the uh, issues what, uh, where we can understand what need is, where need may arise for us to have a second Juma. So the author, he said without need, then Juma is haram to have ta'addad, to have more than one Juma in a locality. 
He says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, فَإِنْ فَعَلُوا فَصَحِيَةُ مَا بَاشَرَهَا الْإِمَامِ أَوْ أَذِنَ فِيهَا If it is established a second Jum'ah without need in the land, then the correct from amongst them, the one which will be validated from amongst them, is the one where the leader of the state he attends. So in the past, the Salaf radiallahu anhum, it would be their way that the leader of the state or the one that is deputized by him, he would be the one that would lead the Jum'ah in the largest of the Masajid or in an outdoor place uh, where the Muslims have gathered to pray Salatul Jum'ah. It would be the leader of the state that would take upon this responsibility. So the author is saying that if there's more than one Jum'ah and this is without need, then the correct one, the valid one from amongst those Jum'ahs is going to be the one where the leader of the state has attended. فيها, or he's given permission for that Jum'ah to take place. Okay. Now a question to yourselves is that when the author has said أو أذن فيها or the leader of the state has given permission for that Jum'ah to take place then that is the valid one. This uh, creates a, a slight problem for us uh, pertaining to those words or the leader of the state has given us permission. Question to yourselves, what can that problem be? If you think about the last week's lesson what problem can arise with the words where he said or the leader of the state has given permission does anybody know طيب. so the author rahimullah ta'ala if you remember when he was speaking about shurutu siha the condition conditions pertaining to the validity of juma what makes the juma valid not what makes the juma obligatory the author he said and it is not from them to have permission from the imam from the leader of the state this is what we mentioned last week but here he is mentioning that the leader of the state if he gives permission and there's more than one juma without need then the one that he has given permission for then that is the valid one so the ulama they explain whether you whether you state that the condition from the imam the permission from the imam is a condition for validity or not the fact of the matter here is that there's uh, more than one Jummah taking place and the Imam has given permission to one of these Masajid so if another Jummah takes place beyond what he has given permission it's as though the Imam, the leader of the state is being disobeyed and this is something which is not allowed to disobey the Imam in matters which are pertaining to that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not allowed as mentioned by Sheikh, Sheikh Fahd al-Mutiri and others so this is what they understand uh, by the statement of the Imam uh, al-Hajjawi here saying the permission of the uh, leader of the state whereas previously uh, he mentioned when he was talking about the uh, the shurut al-siha the conditions for validity he said it's not a condition uh, t for the validity of the Jummah to have permission from the Imam in any case the author he says فَإِنْ أَسْتَوَيَا فِي إِذْنْ أَوْ عَدْمِهِ فَثَانِيَةٌ بَاطِلَةٌ so if they are equal in terms of permission for example the imam has given permission to two of them both masajid okay and again this is in a situation where there's no need for a second juma so the author is saying if the imam the leader of the state has given permission for both masajid or the uh, leader of the state has not given permission for either of the masajid then the second of this masajid to establish the juma is the one which is going to be invalidated وَإِنْ وَقَعَتَا مَعًا And if both of them, they start the Jum'ah at the same time أو جُهِلَةُ الْأُولَى Or it's unable to discern which one was first and which one was second بَطَلَتَا Then in this situation, both of these Jum'ahs will be held as being invalid. Okay? So in a situation where the Imam has given permission to both, to two Masajid then it's the one that starts first is the one which is valid. Okay? And if the Imam didn't give uh, permission to either of them, then again, it's the one which starts first. Uh, if they are both started together, the Masajid, they both start the Takbiratul, uh, the, the Khutbah together and the Takbiratul Ihram together uh, for the Salah, then it's the one which started first, which is going to be valid. If we are unable to discern which one started first and which one started second, then both of them will be rendered as being invalid. And the reason for this, again, is that the need is only for one Juma in this particular scenario so the second uh, Juma is going to be held as invalid because there's no need for it and it's uh, something which the Imam said a few sentences ago that it's haram to have more than one Juma without need طيب. Sheikh Sa'di ta and Uthaymin um, both from the humbly scholars they said that if the Imam gives permission to both Masajid 
then we take both of them to be valid as a minority opinion in the Hanbali school. The author he says, وَأَقَلُّ سُنَّةِ بَعْدَ الْجُمْعَةِ رَقْعَتَانِ وَأَكْثَرُهَا سِتْتُونَ The author he mentions now that the least of the Jum'ah that should be performed after Salat al-Jum'ah, the least of the prayer of Sunan that should be performed is two, and the most of them is six. So Imam Ahmed Ta'ala, he held the opinion that a person can pray anything between two rak'at or four rak'at or six rak'at, as many as the, uh, the performer wishes to pray from amongst whether it be two, four or six. So there's no Salat al ratiba there's no ratiba no uh, Sunnah Mu'akkada before Salat al Jumma, And the reason for that is because the Prophet Sallallahu is never narrated that he came to the masjid early. He would always come just before the Adhan was going to be given, at the time the Khutbah is going to be established and he would uh, enter upon the Mimbar and then the Adhan would be given. So the Prophet Sallallahu never came before uh, the time where the uh, Adhan is going to be given and uh, therefore he never prayed the Ratiba. So pertaining to two raka'at, there's the narration in Bukhari and Muslim from the hadith of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, where he said, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يصلي بعد الجمعة حتى ينصرف فيصلي رقعتين. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would never pray after Jumma until he had turned away from facing the Qibla. And then he would pray two raka'at. So this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim, alluding to the fact that the Sunnah can be prayed as two, okay, after Salat al Jum'ah. We have in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, hadith Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا صَلَّى أَحَدُكُمْ بَعْدَ الْجُمْعَةِ فَلْيُصَلِّ أَرْبَعَةِ That the Prophet sallallahu said, إِذَا صَلَيْتُمْ بَعْدُ الْجُمْعَةِ فَصَلُّوا أَرْبَعًا That if you pray after Jum'ah, then pray for raka'at. And this is in the hadith in Sahih Muslim of Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. We have a narration also which mentions that you can pray six raka'at. So Abu Dawood rahimullah ta'ala collects and uh, Imam Nawi in Khulasat al-Ahkam said the hadith is authentic that uh, Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu إذا كان بمكة فصلى الجمعة تقدم فصلى ركعتين ثم تقدم فصلى عربعا that Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu if he was in Mecca and he prayed Jumma after Jumma he would go forth and he would pray two more raka'at and then after those two raka'at he would go forth and pray another four so this is a total of six uh, raka'at after Salat al So as we said, Imam Ahmad said you can do two, you can do four, or you can do six. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentioned that if you are praying in the masjid, then you should pray four raka'at after having prayed Salat al But however, if you are praying in the house, then your sunnah should be two after Salat al The other thing he says, and it's, it's sunnah and recommended that the person makes ghusl on the day of Jummah. So this is something not wajib according to the madhab. We have the hadith collected by Ahmad, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Khazayim and others. And in Sahih al-Jami'ah, Shaykh al-Albani said it's authentic. The hadith of uh, Sumra ibn Jundum with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man tawadda'a yawm al-Jummah fabiha wa ni'ma. وَمَنْ اِخْتَصَرَ فَالْغُسْلُ أَفْضَلُ The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever makes uh, wudu on the day on the day of Jum'ah, then that is virtuous, then that is a good thing. And whoever makes ghusl, then ghusl is better for the person to do. So Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, as a second opinion in the madhab, he held it to be something which is wajib. He held it to be wajib if the person is one who is sweating a lot or if the person has bodily odors. Okay, in this situation, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah held that it's wajib uh, going against the opinion of the madhab, which is that it's uh, sunnah and recommended. The start time for the ghusl, the Hanbalis, they hold that the start time for the ghusl, that the person is afdal, it's more recommended for the person and more virtuous, that he delayed closer to the time when he's about to leave for Salat al Jummah. So between the person having the ghusl and actually having attended uh, the masjid, there's not much time in between those two actions. And therefore the benefits of that ghusl will be more apparent. However, the actual start time for Juma, uh, ghusl Juma is after Fajr. So anybody can make the Juma ghusl after Fajr 
on the day of Juma. This is according to the Madhab. And the evidence for this they take from the hadith of Abu Huraira, Man ikhtasala yawmul Juma. The Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever made ghusl on the day of Juma, right? So the ghusl is connected to the day of Juma, and the day of Juma starts from Fajr. So this is their understanding of the fact that the timing for a ghusl starts from the Fajr Salah. However, it's better and more preferred that the person delays the uh, ghusl al Juma until before he is going to the masjid. The author he says, what and this has proceeded. What he means here that this discussion about uh, ghusl being a sunnah and something recommended on Juma has proceeded in the Kitab al Tahara, in the chapter of purification. Okay. The author he says, and also from the Sunnah of Salatul Jummah is that the person that the person removes excess pubic hair as well as armpit hair and trims the nails and trims the moustache and has the beard in a tidy manner and the hair on the head in a tidy manner. وَيَتَطَيِّبْ means that the person he uses a tib of the house, he uses scents which are found in the house, perfumes, oud, etc. Anything which is available because in the hadith in Bukhari of Salman al-Farsi رضي الله عنه, the Prophet sallallahu said لا يغتصل رجلا رجل يوم الجمعة that a person doesn't make ghusl on the day of Jumr, Jumr. وَيَتَطَهْرُ مَسْتَطَاعَ مِنْ طُهْرٍ and he purifies himself to the best of his ability of purification وَيَدَّهِنُ مِنْ دُهْنِهِ and he uses grease or uh, yeah, a, a type of grease on his head أو يَمَسُّ مِنْ طِيبِ بَيْتِهِ or he uses the perfumes of his house ثُمَّ يَخْرُجُ فَلَا يُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ الْإِثْنَيْنِ then he leaves for the masjid and he, when he gets to the masjid he doesn't divide between two people ثُمَّ يُصَلِّ مَا كُتِبَ لَهُ and then he prays what he's able to pray ثُمَّ يُنْسِتُ إِذَا تَكَلَّمَ الْإِمَامِ and then he remains silent when the imam is given the khutbah إِلَّا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ الْجُمْعَةِ الْأُخْرَى except that it's forgiven for him between this Juma and the previous Juma. So huge rewards for establishing the Sunan mentioned in this hadith and from those mentioned is that the person should take طيب يتطيب that the person should adorn himself with uh, atar, perfume etc. The ulama they mention that if the man he cannot find anything to perfume himself with any atar in the house then he can use in fact his wife's atar right but with the condition that it's not the type of perfume which is specifically known to be only a woman's perfume that it's not a truly feminine perfume so you find sometimes the difference between the perfume that you have and the one that your wife has is not too it can't be differentiated too much there's not much difference between the two aromas however uh, many of the uh, women's perfume is succinct is distinctly known to be a woman's scent so if it's distinctly known to be a woman's scent then that perfume should not be used however if it's close to what a man normally uses then that is permissible to use so in any case from the sunnan is that the person should put uh, a type of uh, grease or oil on his hair and he should use uh, perfume wherever he is able to use it Atar, wherever, wherever he's able to use it the author he says وَيَلْبَسَ أَحْسَنَ ثِيَابِهِ and the person should wear the best clothing that he is able to find or at least clothing which is clean and good uh, presentation presentable clothing so in Surah Al-A'raf Allah says يَا بَنِي آدَمِ خُدُوا زِينَتَكُمْ in the كُلِّ مَسْجِدْ O children of Adam take your adornment when you go to every masjid. So when a person attends the masjid for any of the salah, he's supposed to go in presentable clothing, clothing which is clean and covers his aura to the best of the ability. And also in the hadith of uh, Abi Dawood, we have the hadith of Yahya ibn Habban, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Is one of you unable or is it possible for one of you that he takes clothing other than the clothing that he would use for his normal daily working routine. So the Prophet Sallallahu is encouraging here that the clothing should be as clean as possible and should be in a good state. The author he says, and also from the Sunan of the day of Juma, which is very important, is وَيُبَكِّرَ إِلَيْهَا The person makes tabakir, okay? The person goes early to the masjid. Because in the tremendous hadith, which is in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Abu Huraira, 
radiyallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu said, man iqtasala yawmul jum'ati ghusul janaba. Whoever makes the ghusl on the day of Jummah that you would normally make for the janaba, okay? Thumma raha, and then he leaves, fakannama qarraba badnatan. Then it's as though he has uh, put forward for sacrifice a camel. وَمَنْ رَاحَ فِي سَاءَةِ ثَانِيَةً فَأَكَأَنَّمَا قَرَّبَ بَقْرَةً And whoever leaves in the second hour of the day of Jummah after having made this ghusl, then it's as though he has put forward for sacrifice a cow. وَمَنْ رَاحَ فِي سَاءَةِ الثَّالِثَةِ فَأَكَأَنَّمَا قَرَّبَ كَبْشًا أَقْرًا And whoever leaves in the third hour, then it's as though he has put forward for sacrifice a uh, horned ram. وَمَنْ رَاحَ فِي سَاعَةِ الرَّابِعَةِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَرَّبَ دَجَاجَةً And whoever leaves in the fifth hour is as though he has sacrificed a chicken. وَمَنْ رَاحَ فِي سَاعَةِ الْخَامِسَةِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَرَّبَ بَيْضَةً And whoever leaves in the fifth hour, then it's as though he has put forward for sacrifice an egg. Uh, فَإِذَا خَرَّزَ الْإِمَامِ حَدْرَةَ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَسْتَمِنُ الذِّكْرِ And the hadith says when the imam comes out to the member, then the angels, they wrap up the uh, book of deeds and they remain quiet listening to the dhikr, listening to the khutbah. So the, in this narration in Bukhari Muslim, we find clearly that the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging that the person should go early to the masjid. The earlier you go, the greater the reward. So the one who went in the first hour, it was as though he had the reward of sacrificing a camel. And the one who went in the fifth hour, it was as though he had the reward of sacrificing uh, an egg. So it's something which is highly recommended. So it's recommended tabkir to go early to the masjid. Question to yourselves, who is it not recommended for to go early to the masjid from amongst the men? Barakallahu fiqh asantum, the khatib, as I alluded to a few moments ago, that the Prophet sallallahu he wouldn't go early to the masjid. That's why there was no sunnah ratib. Rather, he would go only at the time when the khutbah is about to start. That was the, that's what the imam is supposed to do. Uh, in the madhab, they say the time for tabkir, the time for going early, starts from the time of the adhan of fajr. So as Sheikh Mutalaq Jasr ta'ala and other of the ulama, they said that if the person on the day of Jummah, he can have the intention from going to Salat al-Fajr uh, and Salat al-Jummah from the time of fajr. So he intends to go to the masjid for fajr and also he intends to have tabkir, to go early for Salat al-Jummah and then for him, the reward will be written, inshallah ta'ala. The author, he says, Mashian, that from the sunnah of Jummah is that the person should go to the masjid walking if possible. And this is something which brings about huge rewards. Shaykh Al-Albani, uh, rahimullah ta'ala, in Sahih Al-Jami'ah, he mentions the following hadith as being authentic. The hadith of Aws ibn Aws al-Thaqafi, radiyallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said these amazing words. مَنْ غَسَلَ الْيَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ وَاَغْتَصَلَ ثُمَّ بَكَرَ وَابْتَكَرَ وَمَشَ وَلَمْ يَرْكَبْ Whoever made ghusl, a proper ghusl on the day of Jummah, okay, and then he went early to the masjid and he walked and he didn't ride a beast. وَدَنَا مِنَ الْإِمَامِ فَاسْتَمْعَ وَلَمْ يَلْغُ And then he was close to the imam in sitting and he listened to the best of his ability and he didn't do anything from speaking or playing which would invalidate his Jummah. كَانَ لَهُ بِخُولِ خُطْوَةٍ عَمُلُ سَنَةٍ أَجْرُ سِيَامِهَا وَقِيَامِهَا Then for this person, then for every step this person took to the masjid, he has the reward of a year's worth of fasting and standing in prayer. So every step the person took after having made ghusl and leaving to the masjid to go early and then having sat close to the imam and listening to the khutbah uh, with full attention and not making any laghu, then this person for every step he took going to the masjid, there is that huge reward of having the reward of fasting a year for each step and praying a year for each step. May Allah make us from those who chase after such rewards. Ameen. The author he says, وَيَدْنُوَا مِنَ الْإِمَامِ The person should come close to the imam, meaning that he should sit in the close rows as close as possible to the member, to the imam, so that he can get the reward of being in the early rows, in the first rows as well as being able to concentrate upon what the Imam is saying without any difficulty. The author, he said, وَيَقْرَأْ سُورَةَ الْكَهْفِ فِي يَوْمِهَا From the Sunnah also of uh, Jummah is to read Surah Al-Kahf on the day of Jummah. So we have in the Hadith collected by Imam Al-Hakim in his Mustadraq and Imam Al-Bayhaqi in Sunnah Al-Kubra, 
which is authentic that the Prophet said from Abi Sa'id al Khudri. Uh, that the person who reads Surah Al-Kahf on the day of Jum'ah, then for him there is a light which emanates between the two Jum'ahs, between this Jum'ah and the next Jum'ah. Okay, the reading of the Surah Al-Kahf according to the Madhab, the Mu'tamad opinion, starts from Fajr of the day of Jum'ah till Maghrib. So the Mu'tamad, the relied upon opinion in the Madhab, is that it starts from Fajr till Maghrib. And one riwaya in the madhab is that it's from Laylatul Jum'ah, meaning that it's from Thursday night after Maghrib, that the person can start to pray, start to read Surah Al-Kahf to get the reward. The author, he says, وَيُكْثِرُ dua, And the person from the Sunan of uh, Yawm Al-Jum'ah is that he increases in making as much dua as possible. Why? Because we have the hadith, hadith collected by Imam Ahmad, which alludes to this. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said, Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ذكر يوم الجمعة that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned about يوم الجمعة فقال فيه ساعة لا يوافقها عبد مسلم in it there is an hour which a Muslim person does not manage to find وهو قائم يصلي يسأل الله تعالى شيئا and in that hour he is worshiping Allah عز وجل and making dua to Allah سبحانه وتعالى asking him إلا أعطاه إياه except that Allah سبحانه وتعالى would give him from his مسألة would give him that which he is asking and the Prophet ﷺ made the gesture with his hand saying that it's very little, meaning that the time for this Sa'at uh, al-Istijaba, the time for the uh, prayer to be answered on the day of Jummah is quite a short time. Imam Ibn Qayyim ta'ala, he said after looking at the opinions uh, of this Sa'at al-Istijaba, the hour on Jummah which wherein the dua is uh, answered, uh, he and there's many opinions. Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimullah ta'ala narrowed them down to two. The first of them is when the Imam sits on the member until the Salah is completed. So when the Imam first sits on the member before the Adhan is given, until the Salah is actually finished, this is one of the times or one of the uh, highly uh, viable opinions. Uh, the second of them, uh, the Imam he mentioned that it's the last hour after Asr. This is the last hour after Asr, and this is the one that Ibn Qayyim Rahimullah Ta'ala, he himself preferred. Okay. The author, he says, وَيُكْثِرْ صَلَىٰ عَلَى النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وسلم. And it's something which is very highly recommended to make Salah upon the Prophet وسلم, as much as possible on the day of Jummah, as well as outside of the day of Jummah. And one should always remember that the Prophet وسلم, is not in need of my Salah or your Salah. Because he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is making salah upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and also the malaika are making salah upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is me and you that need the reward and the virtue of this salah upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we should do as much of it as possible on the day of Jummah. The author he says, وَلَا يَتَّخَطَّ رِقَابَ النَّاسِ And the person, he shouldn't step over the necks of people when he's in the masjid. This is something which is makru is something which is disliked in the madhab, right? And Ibn Taymiyyah ta held it to be haram. So the madhab holds it to be, as they relied upon opinion, to be makruh. And Ibn Taymiyyah he said rather it's haram due to the fact that the Prophet ﷺ warned against it. The author, he says, إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ إِمَامًا أَوْ إِلَىٰ فُرْجَةٍ Unless an exception from the ruling of kiraha, from the ruling of dislike, is unless the person is Imam, meaning that the Imam he needs to get to the member and the only way he can get to the member is by stepping over the shoulders or moving people so that he can get to the member. This is one of the exceptions. Another exception, the author he mentions, أو إلى فرجتين, or a person wants to and needs to get to a space which he can see. Okay, so how they understand this point is that the حقوق uh, الناس, the right of the people has been lifted they have lost their right to not have someone step over their necks if they have left a space in front of them which they could have filled. Because now the person behind them needs a space and the only space that he can get to is the one that they have left. So they've lost their right to not have somebody step over them because of the fact that they didn't fill that space. So this person who comes and he needs to find a space, he should go and fill the space which is closer to the Imam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Question here pertaining to space. If uh, somebody, for whatever reason, uh, is sitting in a closer row and then somebody comes and for whatever reason the person wants to give up his space, 
so that that person can sit in his space. So I'm sitting in a close row and then a friend of mine comes or my sheikh comes or somebody who I feel is uh, of virtue, then I give up my space and I, I allow that person to sit in my space. What is the ruling of this? This action, what is the ruling of giving up my space? Hassan, so you, you're, you're partially correct, Barakallah Feek, as we'll come to know in a few moments, inshallah. So the ulama, such as in uh, Imam Bahuti, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his uh, explanation of Zad al Mustaqni and Rawd al Murbi', he said that it's makru for the person to give up his space. Why? Because catching the closest space to the Imam is virtuous, it's something where you are rewarded more, and so nobody should ever give up his reward for somebody else, right? So you, there's no ithar, there's no uh, preference when it comes to reward. If it's a chance for you to get the reward, you should fill that space because you are in need of reward on the Day of Judgment more than anybody else. This is how we look at it. And also the second thing that he said is with regards to the person who the space is being offered to, for this person, it's allowed for him to take the space. And though it's makru, it's dislike for me to give the space. However, if I do give the space, then the one taking it, it's allowed for him to take the space. The author, he says now, alluding to what the brother just mentioned, And it's forbidden for a person to uh, tell somebody else to stand up from a place and then to sit in that place. In the hadith in Bukhari of Ibn Umar, عنه, the Prophet وسلم, said, الرجل That nobody should stand up a person from his space because he has more right to it and then sit in that space. And sadly, we have some people of arrogant nature that behave in this manner. They feel that they can just boss around the workers or tell people to move around and they sit in that space. No, if somebody comes to the masjid and they have that space, they are more right to that space once they have sit in there. The Prophet, the author, he says, Except in the situation where somebody has told one of his companions or one of his family members to sit in a space and to reserve that space for him. So now in this situation it's different because the one who's going to get up from the space and give it to the one who's asked him to reserve that space, he's doing this voluntarily. He sat in the space voluntarily reserving this for the one that he wants to give it up to. So in this situation it's, it's allowed for somebody to reserve a space if the person agrees to give it up to them. But it's not allowed, like we mentioned in the previous situation, to force somebody to move from this space. This is what which is not allowed. The author he says, وَحَرُّمَا رَفْءُ مُصَلَّمْ مَفْرُوشْ مَا لَمْ تَحْضُرِ الصَّلَاةِ And it's not allowed, it's impermissible, it's haram to lift up something which has been left to reserve a space, okay? As long as the salah is not established. So if somebody comes to the masjid early and he leaves a sajada or he leaves a jacket, a coat or something of that nature to reserve a space, but then he's not in that particular space, he's sitting somewhere else in the masjid, or he may even be outside of the masjid. Then it's not allowed for anybody else who comes to the masjid to remove that uh, musalla, to remove that prayer mat or anything like the jacket, etc., which is being used to reserve the space for the person. Because number one, it's not his property. We don't have the right to uh, move anybody's property. And also the Prophet ﷺ in the previous hadith that we just took, that if somebody has you know, reserved the place, he's sitting in the place, then it's not allowed for someone to move that person from that place. And the sajada, the mat or the coat is taking the place of the one sitting in the place. So in this situation, we cannot remove uh, what the person has placed down to reserve a spot, unless it comes to a situation where now the iqama is about to be established and the person hasn't returned. If the iqama is about to be established and the person hasn't returned, now the rights of the majority, which is that the people they want to establish the salah, overtakes the right of that individual person who hasn't returned to this spot. So the only time you can remove somebody's coat or sajad or mat etc, prayer mat, is when the iqama is going to be established according to this opinion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. A second riwayah in the madhab held by Ibn Qayyim, Ali bin Taymiyyah and Uthaymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, may Allah have mercy upon them, is that you can remove it in any situation. Because they say, لا يجوز وضع sajadid. Okay, that in this situation, uh, in the, with regards to leaving something to um, reserve a spot, uh, these ulama from the madhab, they said that it's not permissible. طيب. The author, he says, 
ثم عاد إليه قريبا فهو حق به the author may Allah have mercy upon him he said whoever stands up from his place due to a reason okay like he needs to go and make wudu or he needs to attend to something okay لعارضٍ لحقه that something comes upon him and he needs to get up from his space and then he returns to his space soon then he has more right to it okay so this person he's left like a bottle maybe to show that he's sitting here when this person returns okay he's allowed to go back to that space more than anybody else because in Sahih Muslim Abu Hurair radiyallahu anhu writes that the Prophet sallallahu said man qama min majlisihi thumma raja ilayhi fa huwa ahqqu bihi whoever gets up from his place and then returns to it he is the one that has more right to it he is the one that has more right to it the author he says وَمَنْ دَخْلَ وَالْإِمَامُ يَخْطُبْ لَمْ يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُسَلِّيَ رَقْعَتَيْنْ يُجِزُوا فِيهِمَا The author he's mentioning also now something which is uh, very important to do that if one enters in the masjid and the imam is giving the khutbah then the person shouldn't sit down until he prays two rak'ah and he makes these two rak'ah very short why? because in the hadith of Bukhari of Jabir ibn, Abdal, Jabir ibn Abdillah the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا جَاءَ أَحَدُكُمْ وَالْإِمَامُ يَخْتُبْ أَوْ قَدْ خَرَجْ فَلْيُسَلِّ رَقَعَتَيْنِ وَلْيَتَّجَوُزْ فِيهِمَا The Prophet ﷺ said, according to the hadith of Jabir, that if one of you come to the masjid and the imam is giving the khutbah, or he has come to the member, then pray two rak'atayn, pray rak'atayn, and be quick in them. Be quick in these two rak'at. طيب. So this is something which is imperative for the person to do. Okay, uh, question for yourselves. If one enters at the time of the Adhan, should the person pray to Raka'at or should he wait until the Adhan has finished? Because we know that it's something which is highly recommended to repeat the Adhan. So in the situation where he's come to the Masjid on Juma, and the Adhan for the Juma is being given, okay, before the uh, Khutbah, should he wait and listen to the Adhan or should he go ahead and pray to Raka'at? Question to yourselves. Has Barakallahu feek. Ahsant. Listening to the khutbah here is something which is wajib, something which is obligatory, whereas repeating the adhan is something which is sunnah. So that which is obligatory takes precedence over that which is sunnah. Okay? And also because, yeah, that is the answer. Barakallahu feek. Very good. Ahsant. The author, he says, وَلَا يَجُوزُ الْكَلَامُ وَالْإِمَامُ يَخْطُبْ And it's not allowed for a person to speak while the imam is speaking. So a person who is listening, the mustami' The ma'mum cannot speak while the imam is giving the khutbah because the Prophet Allah says in Surah Al-A'raf uh, If the Qur'an is being recited then pay heed to it and pay attention, listen carefully perhaps or in the hope that you will gain Allah's mercy. So this verse was revealed pertaining to the khutbah that the people when the khutbah is being recited that they should remain silent. And also we have in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet said, If you say to somebody, your companion, who is making noise or is messing around while the Imam is giving the khutbah, you tell him to be quiet and to behave, then you yourself have committed laghu. You yourself have done something which will invalidate the uh, reward of the khutbah. So it's imperative that when the khutbah is being given, that the person remains silent and the person doesn't speak and the person doesn't move stuff in front of him or fidget with anything because that will diminish the reward of the person. Imam Mardawi from amongst the humbly scholars in Al-Insaf, he says that it's allowed to speak between the two khutbas. It's allowed to speak between the two khutbas. As Sheikh Salih Al-Fawzan, Hafid Allah Ta'ala also said, that when the Imam is silent between the two khutbah and at this point you can speak if you need to tell your children to behave if you need to tell somebody to be quiet then this may be a time that you are able to do so also the Hanbali scholars that is, they said it's allowed for the non khatib to send salah upon the Prophet ﷺ quietly so when the Imam mentions the name of the Prophet ﷺ while he's giving khutbah it's allowed for you to move your tongue and your lips uh, quietly to send salah upon the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al mutiri Allah Ta'ala. The author he says, Illa lahu awliman yukallimuhu. So it's not allowed to speak during the khutbah except for the Imam or the one who is speaking to the Imam. 
So if it's important for the Imam to stop his khutbah and to address the uh, audience, like for example, many a time people are not for, uh, filling the gaps and there's people waiting outside in the heat, then the Imam would stop and say to the people to come together, uh, close the gaps, come forward, make room for your brothers and sisters outside. <clears throat> Or for one who is speaking or needs to speak to the Imam due to necessity. Like when the Bedouin came in, in the Hadith, and he mentioned to the Prophet Sallallahu that the uh, livestock were being, um, the livestock was spoiled due to the fact that there was a drought. So he asked the Prophet Sallallahu to make dua. So if there's a maslaha ama, if there's a general maslaha, then that can be done. وَيَجُوزُ قَبْلَ الْخُطْبَةِ وَبَعْدَهَا The author is saying it's permissible to speak before the khutbah and to speak after the khutbah, right? Because Imam Malik, he collects the hadith of Tha'laba ibn Abi Malik, أَنَّهُمْ كَانُوا زَمَانَ عُمْرِ بِنْ خَطَّابِ يُصَلُّونَ يَوْمُ الْجُمْعَةِ حَتَّى يَخْرُجُ الْعُمْرِ فَإِذَا خَرَجَ وَجَلَسَ إِلَى مِنْبَرِ وَأَذْنَ الْمُؤَذِّنِ قَالَ Tha'laba جَلَسْنَا نَتَحَدِّثْ That Tha'laba رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He said in the time of Umar, when Umar uh, would give the khutbah, we would speak until the adhan was given until uh, Umar started his khutbah. So when Umar, he would sit on the member and the adhan was given, then Tha'laba, he said, we would speak until the adhan was given. وَقَامَ Umar سَكَتْنَا فَلَمْ يَتَكَلَّمْ أَحَدًا أَحَدٌ مِنَّا But when Umar would get up and he would speak and he would start the khutbah, then we would stop talking and we would be silent. Okay, Imam Malik, he collected that athar. Question to yourselves. If the masjid is large, it's a big masjid and the sound is cut off. And you can't hear the Imam giving the khutbah, but you can see him. Are you allowed in this situation to talk? So you can't hear the Imam, but you can see him. Are you allowed, or even if you can't see him, are you allowed in this situation to talk? Because you can't hear the Imam. Barakallahu feek. Jazakallahu khair. Jazakallahu khair. So, um, Shaykh Mansur al-Bahuti in Sharh al-Muntaha, Al-Iradat, he said that if you cannot hear the Imam, then in this situation it's not haram to speak. However, it's better that the person busies himself with dhikr and making mention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Shaykh uh, Akhi Sulaiman mentioned a good point just now, which I didn't think about before, that though uh, this uh, Imam, this scholar and others allow it for the person to speak in this situation, it's better not to speak because you may make tashwish upon those who are trying very hard to able to hear the khutbah and even if they're near you and they can't hear the khutbah then maybe they're trying to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a time of worship so maybe in this situation it's better not to speak but rather quietly make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so in any case Sheikh Mansur al-Bahuti in Sharh al-Muntaha al-Iradat he said that it's permissible to speak but it's better to make dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quietly Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr hafizullah ta'ala and Sheikh Fahad al-Matiri they said the modern application of this ruling of Sheikh Mansur al-Bahuti also applies to situations where you go to a khutbah and you cannot understand a word that the Imam is saying. So you can hear the Imam speaking, right? But you cannot understand the word he's saying. It's in a language different to a language that you understand. He said in this, they said in this situation, the same ruling applies that you can make a dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can even read Quran from your mind or from your phone quietly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. طيب, with this we come to the end and uh, we'll stop here inshallah anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan if you have any questions then feel free inshallah